looks like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is, we're going to do an introduction to the Mirkaba Ascent because we're going to do a mini Mirkaba Ascent tonight. Um, Mirkaba, Mirkaba, as I said before, is the Hebrew word for the chariot throne of God. Uh, it was seen in visions by Ezekiel and Isaiah and other prophets and sages, including Yeshua. And it even is preserved in the idea of old hymns, you know, like Swing Low, Sweet Chariot and things like that. Uh, and this is one uh, attempt at a visual uh, portrayal of what Ezekiel describes. You'll notice in this picture there are uh, wheels within wheels uh, and, and different kind of things. But there's lots of ways. You, there's no one simple image you can get to describe his vision. Uh, and that's why it became such a, an important element for contemplation for people. Contemplation on the Merkaba. It was called the, the Masa Merkaba, the work of the chariot. But it was a mobile royal seat for a king who traveled with his troops. And Yahweh was originally a god of, I am a god of war, <laughs> who uh, bashes the heads of the babies on the stones and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You, you, you don't want to read the whole Bible, you want to know what's in there. <laughs> um, but Yahweh, as king of the universe, was everywhere at every time. So this is the understanding of the Mirkaba later by a little more sophisticated. As we, as time passes, people get more sophisticated in their understandings of things and they're not quite so bloodthirsty. Uh, because remember, the history of the Bible, the understanding of religion, is not that God has grown or changed, it's just that human understanding has grown and changed. In the pre-exilic period, before we had an astrological understanding of the universe, God traveled, quote, in a whirlwind in the Merkava chariot and ruled from mountaintops. So like Zeus, he throws thunderbolts at people and things like this. Uh, heaven was in the sky, uh, so Elijah and the other prophets ascended into the throne to receive the word of God. But it was in the day sky. There were two skies. There was a night heaven and a day heaven. And in, in the day heaven, you could see no stars. It was just the sun. And uh, when the sun went down, it went down into the night heaven. There were two, two heavens. They were called the Shemayim. That's a plural. And the, there were two Shemayim, two heavens. The day heaven and the night heaven. The night heaven was a place of mystery. In the Greek religion, it represented the underworld, the world of Pluto and Persephone, where all the mysteries people would descend and to receive revelations and things like this. Uh, in the Hebrew tradition, where you descended was into the night sky, where you ascended into the night sky. It was the same thing as descending into the underworld, the divine underworld. And so the night sky was a place where all the stars were and that sort of thing, where the mysteries would be experienced. And that's where you would ascend to the throne. <coughs> Elijah discovered that God did not speak from a fire or a whirlwind or an earthquake, but in a still small voice. Very famous passage from, uh, from, the, from scripture. And he learned to meditate with his head between his knees. He's, he's up on Mount Carmel and he's calling down rain. He's, he's called in a drought and to punish Israel for three years or something. Now he has to bring some rain back. And we have a picture of him sitting on Mount Carmel with his head between his knees. He must have been a pretty skinny, skinny dude. I could never <laughs> get my nose down on my knees, I don't think. But, uh, uh, and uh, this is a, a special sitting posture that was used for this kind of meditation. And um, he was doing this, of course, to discredit the storm god, Baal, who was a, a lord of storms and things to show that Yahweh was superior to these foreign gods and things like that. But it gives us a point, it gives us an insight into the posture that were used because there were already postures for sitting and understanding uh, how one would ascend to the Merkava and how would one would go into divine communion. And that, of course, is, is furthered in the teachings of Yeshua who says, when you pray, do it in private. Don't go out in public and say your stuff out loud. I hate, still hate public prayer. I feel like an idiot when somebody stands up and says, let us pray. And I say, well, why don't you go pray by yourself and let us pray, you know? Uh, but I, I find that public prayer is just not the thing. Well, Yeshua didn't like public prayer. He liked private prayer. 
And he said, when you do, you go into your secret place. Encrypto is the term in Greek. Well, this is what the prophets did. They went by themselves and they went in deeply and that's how they communed with heaven and with God. Uh, and, and in the stories of Elijah, he ascends bodily to heaven in a mirkaba, in a chariot of fire. That's where the term chariot of fire comes from, from movies. Instead of dying, so he's bodily assumed into heaven and the chariot comes down and gets him. And that's the old spiritual swing of those with chariot and so on. But basically, that's the Mirkama, and that's the vehicle of ascent. The vehicle of fire and light. So Isaiah is taken up to, uh, to the Mirkama, the, the, the throne of God by angels, and given a prophetic message. Now, in the Babylonian exile, we get something a little different. We get the great vision of Ezekiel. And this happens... Ezekiel is in Babylon when he has this vision. Um, in the post-exilic period, we have a Babylonian astrological universe because astrology wasn't known and practiced and understood. All was done was just uh, what was rising on the horizon. This is Egyptian astrology. Now we have planets and we understand there are planets <coughs> and we have horoscopes and things. We have an understanding of the different heavens, the different crystalline spheres that things go around in. And so in the Babylonian astrological universe, God rules from a Merkaba throne in the 10th heaven, which is uh, Erevot, which is beyond the zodiac of fixed stars. And that's the way it's understood. So in, in, in the later visions that come after Ezekiel that are of Enoch, Enoch the prophet, Enoch was coming in the 2nd, 3rd century, 1st century. Uh, you have uh, stories of ascent through the heavens to the throne of God. And this is what Merkaba mysticism becomes. So the throne chariot vision of Ezekiel, he's in Babylon, in Babylon during the captivity and it's visually similar the descriptions of what he's seen are similar to Near Eastern and Egyptian images you find in temples and in the Temple of Solomon. The images in the first Temple of Solomon were of these sort of strange uh, combination beasts, like you will find in Assyrian and other temples. Like in the Temple of Solomon, here are uh, grand beasts that guard, uh, that guard the, the Ark of the Covenant and so on. This is one artist's rendition of what they would look like. We get that from temple paintings, but his images in his vision of the throne of God come from temples, come from the, the frescoes on temples and the statues and temples of Near Eastern understandings of heavenly beasts and so on. They're astrological. He talks about a chariot that was made of many malachim, many angels. And this is the first one, the first time we get a real mention of angels and his, historic history of Hebrew religion, being driven by the likeness of a man. It doesn't say a bar enough. It says someone who looks like a man, a human being, and that's Yahweh. Now, four angels form the basic structure of the chariot, and these angels are called the chayot, the living creatures, the four living creatures. The bodies of a chayot are like that of a human being, but each of them has four faces corresponding to the four directions that the chariot can go, north, south, east, and west. And the faces are like that of a man, a lion, and an ox, and an eagle. What does that make you think of? The signs of the zodiac, the fixed signs of the zodiac. Well, there, and there's that, and there's what else? Yeah. There's all, there are also four signs of, for the tribes of Israel. It's also, and it's also the, the symbols for the four gospels and different things like that. Uh, the, uh, the it's on the world card of Tarot. Yeah, right. <laughs> You're right. Well, that's because it's, it's, it's Aquarius, Taurus, um, uh, and it's the four so, of its Since there are four angels and each has four faces, there are a total of 16 faces on these creatures. Now, the angel with the face of the man is always on the east side and he looks up at the likeness of the man that drives the chariot. That would be young. And each chayot or angel also has four wings. 
and two of these wings spread across the length of the chariot and connect with the wings of the angel on the other side. And this creates a sort of box of wings that forms a perimeter of the chariot with the remaining two wings each angel covers his own body. So they've got four wings, two, two on each side. And uh, there are many different representations of this. I'm showing you another one now of an artist's understanding of what he is seeing. And here you can see four creatures with four wings and so on. But it all, it's, it's hard to really put it all together in one simple way. And below, but not attached to the feet of the Chayot angels, are other angels that are shaped like wheels. And these wheel angels, which are described as a wheel inside of a wheel, are called the Ophanim which means uh, wheels and cycles or ways, and they probably represent time or olamim. And they're not directly into the chariot, but they're nearby and along its perimeter, and each wheel is full of eyes. Uh, having eyes means conscious. So this is a pretty far out vision, and uh, there are all kinds of speculations about what kind of mushrooms they're eating and things. <laughs> the latest is uh, about acacia, because acacia was a very important Thing that was used in some Hebrew rituals and priestly things, and it has some psychoactive drugs and things. I don't think this is about using psychoactive drugs, although the Hebrew prophets were pretty shamanic dudes, but this guy was a priest. I don't think he was drinking, drinking the uh, juice at this time. Now, is this the next slide we have here? Yes. This is it, okay. Now, when Enoch, and the tradition of Enoch, Enoch is a school, and first the, the first book is the book of Enoch, and then you get the secrets of Enoch and second Enoch and all kinds of different Enochian literature about ascent to the head, through the heavens. And in the secrets of Enoch, we get a very clear description of all the ten heavens and their names and what's in each one. You can see that the first heaven is beneath the area of the moon. And this is, of course, in the order of the speed of which the planets move. Uh, and it's sublunary. That means the sublunary world is the world of uh, the world of clouds and weather and things like that. And then he talks about the angels are there. And uh, the second heaven, uh, which is associated with the planet Mercury, is uh, place includes angels who had rebelled against God, 200 angels who ruled the stars from down here. And then the third heaven is the one we're really interested in. It's ruled by Venus, or one could say Ashtarte, or by uh, the feminine, the Mrs. God type creatures we've talked about before, Asher and so on, that's associated with star Venus. This is where he can hold the garden of paradise. This is where the good people go after they die. But that's only on one side. In the center is the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, and it's guarded by angels. Uh, when the Apostle Paul was caught up to the third heaven, it's the same as where the tree of life is in the book of Revelation. So it was a very clear landscape everybody knew and understood. But on the other side of the third heaven is Gehino. There's purgatory, or hell, if you will. Some people want to call it hell. Uh, where people go to uh, get purified of their bad stuff. And uh, it's also included that this terrible place where the wicked are tortured and all sorts of things. This is the third heaven. Um, in the fourth heaven, there are the phoenix and, the, and many of the hosts of the Lord and different spirits and dragons and luminaries. And that's also the house of the sun. In the fifth, there are the a, a, Gregory, a Gregory with the appearance of men taller than the giants of the earth. These are the biblical Nephilim. They're bound for the transitions for thousands of years. Well, in the Greek myths, the Titans were bound. Uh, but they were down bound under the earth. And this is in lieu of under the earth now, because this is the night sky. So uh, this is where these uh, the results of intercourse between angels and the daughters of men that brought about the Noachic flood. Uh, and created a race of giants that, that had to be destroyed. Uh, this is where they're bound up here. But in the Greek legends, the Titans are bound under the earth. That's the explanation for earthquakes and stuff, because that whole area is very seismically active. 
But here it's in the fifth heaven as associated with the planet Mars. <clears throat> in the sixth heaven, uh, there are bands of angels and he and also cherubim, cherubim, uh, and places of uh, Jupiter and, and so on. And the seventh is where he finds angels with many eyes and the old fanim and different things. Now those are the seven heavens. This is where the uh, this is where the uh, where the fallen angels are bound and the Nephilim are bound and Satan and his hosts live. And uh, the seventh heaven is the highest of the of the of the visible heavens. It's, it's right before you get to the zodiac. Now the zodiac is the eighth. It's known as the Ogdua or the Ogdulas. My dissertation was about the hermetic ascent to the eighth. That's where the saints go. That's where the saints are no longer have to be reincarnated. And they telepathically guide uh, other advanced souls on the earth who can receive their guidance. And that's called Luzolo. And uh, this is the place of the zodiacal constellations and all the stars. Every star is a god. Every star is a deity. And I remember talking to Sarah Darian telling me that it's really great to sleep out on a moonless night under the stars because you receive all the energies of all the divine energies of all the different stars that each have different non-divine energies that you can absorb and receive. And uh, then you have the ninth heaven, the Ennead. And that is the place before the throne of God that is associated with the houses of the signs of the zodiac. And that is associated later with the mansions of the palace of God, the Hekaloth, the hallways, the halls of God. And Hekaloth mysticism is what uh, Merkava mysticism finally developed into in, uh, in Jewish Merkava mysticism that we call the Hekaloth mystics. And that's after the time of Yeshua, a couple of centuries. Yeah. Um, you had a different name here. You, s you had something with an N that Enyad. I didn't quite he catch. And this is he said any yeah, and this is Kuvachim. For the ninth. Doesn't this say Kuvachim here? Yes, but you said Ennead or something like no, that. No, well, it is. That's a Greek word for the ninth heaven. Oh, okay. Ennead means ninth. Okay. Abdullah means eighth. Okay. The eighth day All right. in Christianity is associated with the day of the saints. It's the, the eighth heaven is where the saints dwell. They don't dwell in paradise. The ones who ne never need to come back and they are awake in the Kima, the ones who are, have achieved the Kima are in the eighth heaven. And it's the same with the Hermetic Saints. The ninth heaven is a place through which these eventually are absorbed into the throne of God, which is at the tenth heaven. And there's much more to all this, but I'm just showing you a kind of a, a basic chart of how that all kind of looks in the Enochian heavens. Yeah. Now, <coughs> the Mirkaba ascent is, is implied by the fact that there is a basor, there's a message from the throne of God. It's implied by that. Yeshua delivered a divine message he must have received from the throne of God. He's basically saying, I've been there and I've been given a message. He retreats into the wilderness for seclusion over and over again, but he doesn't spend his whole life there. He spends very little time in seclusion. He just goes there for retreat and refreshment. He doesn't go off in caves and stay there for 20 years. Uh, he continually retires by himself with a small number of disciples, Talmudian. Uh, the story of casting seven devils out of Mary Magdalene and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene is very, very interesting because uh, the, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene uh, tells us a story of her being taken through the seven heavens and purified by Yeshua as, a, as, a, as an initiation of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, yeah. When you do this Merkava sin, do you just like go through to the seventh heaven and you see up to the tenth? Is that how it works? No, he, never, he goes up, Enoch goes the whole way. He goes all the way to the tenth? Yeah. Because I didn't quite, you know, we have in the Yeshua book, where he goes, but it's not quite
quite clear to me exactly what's happening. Of course, it isn't going to be clear except the individual does it. It's not quite clear to me either, because I've never been there. <laughs> so I'm just writing fiction. As I said, my book is fiction, but uh, there's no question but what he was, uh, he was a practitioner of this. And what it will mean, I don't know. What we will experience tonight might be very interesting, but I don't think we're all going to go to the throne of God or anything. But it will, we will have some very interesting experiences tonight. Well, I know that when I read your book, when I was reading about that, it brought back the memories of dreams that I've had. Just certain motions and certain actions and things that I remember. I don't know from where, but anyway. Well, write it down. <laughs> I don't have to write it down. Oh, I, I can it. picture exactly what I remember right this instant. To me. It's that vivid. So it's like, why, why try to put it in words when words won't convey what it was? Well, that often people experience these things more in dream states or perhaps sleep states because your conscious mind is not interfering with your ascent. You know, I'm always half conscious. <laughs> <laughs> Tech writers. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's my conscious avatar. <laughs> but anyway, the story that's translated, when Mary Magdalene and women's leadership is being marginalized, of seven devils being cast out of Mary Magdalene, is a very late thing. The first time we ever hear about it is in the post-Pauline Gospels. Yeah. Would you agree that we're talking about the same thing here that we've been talking about for those people who are in the PDA program or ascending through the chakras and the lokas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It's, it's a very similar kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, we're talking about the same thing. Well, I don't know if it's the same thing, but it's a similar kind of thing. <clears throat> even got the seven. So, yeah. So, uh, if you go to my Wisdom Seminaries classes, you can take the class on the Gospel of Mary and Mary and Gnosis, and you can find out about the other forms of mystic ascent, the hermetic form of mystic ascent, etc., which I write about in my dissertation and so on, and how related that is to what you described from Mary Magdalene and to the Merkava mystics. Uh, the experience on the mountain of the Transfiguration, where he takes three disciples up, Peter, Peter James, and John, and they, he has them watch, he has them do a shakan, which is a vigil, and after a while, all of a sudden they see some other people, they feel real cold, and they see some other people over there with him talking to him, and they decide that, oh my gosh, that's Moses and Elijah, and he's, he's not alone, he's talking to other people, what's happening, you know? And that's called the transfiguration, and the way Christianity has always interpreted it is it's, well, it was, they, were, they were revealed, the glory of Jesus was revealed to them, or something like that. But this was probably a Merkaba type of experience that's remembered in that event. And tonight, when we go under the full moon, uh, that will be more like the kind of uh, experience we might have of something like that because uh, we're going as a group and we're going, uh, we're going to spend enough time in meditation in, in a very sacred time in, at the night time that uh, we may experience some interesting things that way ourselves. But it was clear that Yeshua uh, did an all-night initiation into the mysteries of the kingdom, the Ratzim of the Malkuth. And uh, in the Secret Gospel of Mark, there's a very clear description of that. Uh, and you should, you should read what you can of the Secret Gospel of Mark. I'll show you more about it later. Uh, the ascension of Jesus that's described in Luke Acts, the book of Acts, how Jesus ascends after, he, after he's been 40 days after the resurrection, in Eastern Orthodox paintings, it always shows Yeshua seated in a Merkava as he ascends. And that is like a bubble, it's like a tigli. It's like a, uh, a thing that God sit in that are an infinite uh, void that they sit in and so on. So that's an interesting thing that that's portrayed that way in Eastern Orthodox iconography. Paul talks about his ascent to the third heaven of Pardes, the same heaven that Enoch talks about. In 2 Corinthians, he says, uh, he's, he's defending himself because there are other people who are visionaries and people who have experiences and they uh, do the Holy Spirit and they do a bunch of things and they're telling people about how much authority they have because they're having visions all the time and they're doing things like that. And so Paul is 
justifying himself against these people. So he says, okay, you think these people are so great? I'll tell you about what I, my experiences are. He says, I'll go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to the third heaven of paradise. He's talking, of course, about himself. But in the Merkaba traditions, you don't talk about yourself ascending. You talk about it as someone else. And you don't really talk about it to anybody. So he's breaking a big rule, telling people things. He must have been pretty desperate to establish his spiritual credentials here. Uh, he, meaning Paul, <clears throat> heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. He says, I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. And then he goes ahead and says, well, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I'd be speaking the truth. <laughs> I think he's made it perfectly clear who the man was and what he's talking about. Uh, but uh, so he he's, says he has had this experience and, uh, and it's obviously something that was part of the tradition he was connected with. We have Jewish accounts from the second century. Uh, the work of the chariot, the Masa Merkaba, should not be taught by anyone except he be wise, uh, taught to anyone except he be wise and able to deduce knowledge through the wisdom or the gnosis on his own, by himself. Generally, the, the understanding of the ascent was something you, you learned by yourself, through yourself, uh, and you got some clues to it. This is one of the Talmudic things about it. Uh, another one, Rabbi Eleazar ben Arak was riding on a mule behind Rabbi Johanan ben Zakkai, and ben Zakkai is the, one of the great Merkaba mystics and rabbis of the period, when he asked for the privilege of being initiated into the secrets of the Merkaba. The great master demanded proof of his initiation into the Gnosis, and when Eleazar began to tell what he had learned thereof, Rabbi Johanan immediately descended from the mule and sat upon the rock. Why, O oh Master, dost thou descend from the mule, asked the disciple. Can I remain mounted upon the mule when telling of the secrets of the Merkaba? Uh, and uh, uh, which, which this causes, which causes the Shekinah to dwell with us. If we're going to talk about the Merkaba, the Shekinah is going to come down and dwell with us. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the angels to accompany us. Can I do that sitting on a mule, dummy? And uh, that was the answer. And Eleazar continued, and behold, fire descended from heaven and lit up the trees of the field, causing them to sing anthems. And an angel cried out, truly these are the secrets, the Ratzim of the Merkaba. Whereupon Rabbi Yohanan kissed Eleazar upon the forehead, saying, blessed be thou, O father Abraham, that hast a descendant like Eleazar ben Arach. Subsequently, the other two disciples of Rabbi jo jo Yohanan and Ben Zakkai, walking together, said to each other, let us also talk together about the Masa Merkaba, the work of the chariot. And no sooner did Rabbi Yahshua begin speaking than a, ran a rainbow-like appearance, and that was something mentioned in Ezekiel, of course, was seen upon the thick clouds which covered the sky, <clears throat> and angels came to listen as men do to hear weddings. <coughs> now, notice all the references to weddings and uh, marriage mysticism here. On hearing the things related by Rabbi Yose, Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai blessed his disciples and said, <clears throat> Blessed be the eyes that beheld these things. Indeed, I saw myself in a dream together with you, seated like the select ones upon Mount Sinai. The elect are seated, seated at the table of the, of the Messiah. In the banquet. And the, the word means, the elect in Christianity means not those who are just chosen, but who choose themselves, who are self-elected. And I saw myself in a dream sitting together with you like, and seated like the select ones upon Mount Sinai, and I heard a heavenly voice saying, Enter the banquet hall and take your seats with your disciples and your disciples' disciples among the elect, our highest, which would be the third class. This is, a, this is how spiritual people are seated, seated in the spiritual order and so on. So this is about a wedding banquet. So this is
part of the Merkava tradition is the mysticism of marriage and the wedding banquet. So these themes are themes that you are always associated with this mystical knowledge. Uh, here is another thing that tells us that four entered the pardes, the orchard. That's where you go when you go to paradise. Uh, and that's a partial ascent. <coughs> Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acher, and Rabbi, Rabbi Akiba. One peaked and died. One peaked and was smitten. One peaked and cut down the shoots. One ascended safely and descended safely. That, that one who was safe was Rabbi Akiba, who was considered to be the greatest of the common mystics. But there was considered to be great danger of insanity or death in trying to do the Merkava ascent, and especially if you weren't ready or you were unworthy or anything else. Uh, you can study some of the descriptions I have in Yeshua the Unknown Jesus because uh, it kind of gives you a fiction of how that might be. So, if we look at the evolution of the Merkava ascent, there is spontaneous ascent in which you are accompanied by an angel as you have in the pre exilic periods. Uh, a vision or the night heaven of the Tushimayim above the firmament in Isaiah. There's being assumed bodily into heaven instead of death like Enoch and Elijah. In the post-exilic period, we get the visions of dreams in the day or night heaven and throne, uh, the throne descends or the prophet ascends, for example, Paul. And later we have what we call the riders of the Merkava chariot. This is the non-spontaneous technique. These come from the wisdom schools in Alexandria and Babylon and Palestine. There are meditation techniques and contemplation of Ezekiel's Merkaba images that are used to, to prepare yourself for ascent. And you do it in the night heaven in a chariot. And then there are the Enochian apocalyptic schools in, in Babylon and Palestine. You ascend with a great angel. Uh, sometimes it's Metatron. Enoch himself is said to have become the great angel Metatron. And or a chariot, and there are the Babylonian Greek astrological models of seven to ten heavens. It depends on the system, and there's a great sea and different things like that. And this great angel, whose giant angel, will take you up and protect you through all these things. And then the rabbinic school of Akiba in Palestine, there's a contemplation of Ezekiel's Merkaba images and coming to the great sea. Uh, which is in the ninth heaven, and the addition of the Hekaloth, or hallways to the palace, which is the ninth heaven. And the Hekaloth mystics developed later, second, third century, contemplation using Akiba's methods, but with greater and detailed elaboration of the heavenly palace. And Yeshua's traditions were from the Babylonian wisdom school. That was where he learned his stuff. It came through Ezekiel and other things, and uh, probably related to Enochian as well. These were techniques developed for Enochian ascent through the heavens. Uh, the Book of Enoch is made, the Book of the Secrets of Enoch is made, has three segments, or the Book of Enoch actually. Well, one called the Book of Parables with all the Messianic and Danielic Son of Man references. And the uh, Enoch Metatron, uh, Prince of the World, and things like this you find in that tradition that, that we hear Yeshua echoing. And then there's John the Baptist in the Qumran tradition, Enochian ascent through the heavens. This is what you see in the Book of Watchers and other fragments found in Qumran, which are part of the Enochian literature as well. And his probable method of Merkaba ascent were the wisdom school Enochian techniques of the night heaven meditation, prayer, contemplation of the Merkaba ascent in a Merkaba in a, in, a, in a chariot in the context of a midnight mishkat or vigil because he's constantly telling his disciples, he says, he tells them always to pray, he says, always vigil, and it's translated in the King James, always watch, 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 and everybody thinks he's saying, watch, watch for the kingdom to come. No, no, watch is shaka, it means vigil, it means meditate, it means do this practice. Uh, now, 
Uh, leave when you have to, because I don't want to hold you. Yeah. The Psalm of Jesus that we're going to do from the second century Acts of John, uh, I've given you a link here when you, when you get this online. You can click on this uh, to get a free online version of the Psalm of Jesus. But this is very interesting. St. Augustine of Hippo preserves a prologue showing where it was inserted into a gospel, probably the secret gospel of Mark. Uh, he says, The hymn of the Lord, which he sang in secret to the holy apostles, his disciples, for it is said in the gospel, and after singing a hymn, he ascended the mount. This hymn is not put in the canon because of those who think according to themselves and not according to the spirit and truth of God, and that it is written, it is good to hide the sacrament of the king, but it is honorable to reveal the works of God. So even Augustine of Hippo was talking about the hidden knowledge and the secret knowledge, and the and he recognizes this as, as possibly a historic thing that Yeshua would have sung with his apostles. It was reputedly sung as a responsorial circle dance before Yeshua went to the Mount of Olives to be arrested. And he said, Before I am delivered over unto them, we will hymn the Father, and so go forth to what lieth before us, then bidding us make as it were a ring, by holding to each other's hands, and with him in the midst, he said, Answer Amen to me. And he began to intone a psalm and say, Glory be to thee, Father. And we, going round in a circle, answer to him, Amen, and so on and so on. Now, there are no dance instructions with this psalm, which is, which is written in the, in the second century Acts of John, and may really preserve some historical material. But we will, when we do this after the Easter thing, we will be in a circle like this. I'll be in the center. And we will take one step clockwise, and I'll demonstrate how we do it then, with the left foot, and we will intone, Amen, because that's the proper way to intone it. And uh, I'll describe how we do it. So you don't have to be a great dancer to do anything. It'll just be a simple thing. And most of the declarations that follow each participant as the old Adam being regenerated to Christ through the bar and Asha, things like, I would be liberated and I would liberate. So you're both. You're the Savior and the saved. You're doing the same thing. So this is the idea of, the, of you as the bar and Asha, you as the one who is uh, participating in the greater body and also the other one. Uh, I'll be playing Gustav Holst's uh, uh, composition based on GRS Mead's esoteric transcription and translation of this. Uh, when we do have the Easter service, it'll be in the background for a while. Now, the midnight Merkaba ascent of Yeshua was what we call a mishka. It was a vigil. Uh, Yeshua constantly exhorts his Talmudim to watch. That's what it says in the King James Version. And what I say to you, I say unto all, watch. Well, what is watch? What is this? What's he saying? Uh, it's the apocalyptic New Testament churches all understood this as watching for God's Messiah to come down from heaven. So you're supposed to be saying, mm -hmm. you see anything yet? See anything yet? Wait a minute, didn't he say not low here, not low there? <laughs> uh, uh, he's supposed to be coming up from heaven with troops of angels to wage battle against the Romans and establish God's kingdom on earth. That was their understanding, but that's not what it means. The Aramaic word mishkad, which means spiritual contemplation, is the root of the New Testament Greek word gregorio, which always translates Aramaic and Hebrew shakad, which means to vigil, to meditate, to contemplate, to keep a spiritual watch. Hey, Jesus meditated. Wow, here we are in a Buddhist monastery. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, now the first section of the Book of Enoch that gives a detailed angelology with the names and duties of all the angels is called the Book of Watchers. These 200 watcher angels, the Grigori, were sent to earth to guard and protect humans, but then fell in love with the daughters of men. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just like you guys going to protect the monkeys at the zoo and falling in love with the female monkeys, I guess. I don't know. Not a good thing. And they interbred with them. And they produced the Nephilim, which is the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek myth of the Titans. <coughs> and, uh, 
uh, I should mention that in the fourth century before the Christian era, era, angels were male, not androgynous, but male was understood as androgynous. So they were called male. And so they would interbreed with, uh, with females. They could do that. But andro androgynous beings can interbreed anyway. They can have babies too. Now this is the original story of the fall of Satan and his angels and the cause of the corruption of the earth and humanity and the cause of the Noachic flood. That's why God flooded the earth, purified from all this. Now an egregor, which comes from ek gregor, refers to a living system constructed by the focused force of many minds. And you've heard about the egregor of the temple and so on. And that exists on the astral or etheric planes of Asiya. Where I haven't given you your introduction to Kabbalistic things yet, so you'll get that tomorrow and you'll understand more about that. And it continues to exist as, as long as it continues to be nourished by thought, because it's the product of meditation and mental focus. So with meditation and mental focus, you can create an egregor, you can create other kinds of things. Now, just as Yeshua urged his Talmudim to always pray, he also urged him to abide in ongoing meditation, contemplation, vigil, always keep spiritual vigil. The tradition survived in Gentile Christianity as the Saturday night, all night Easter vigil, which is what people did because of, in early Christianity, the only time people were baptized by the time you got to the mid second century was at Easter. That was when everybody got baptized. They spent the rest of the time, years and years in cate catechumenical schools and as catechumens and catechetical schools, studying all the things they had to learn, all the discursive knowledge and all the belief you had to have before they were ready to be baptized. So they were baptized and initiated on Easter only. Now that, of course, was not what Yeshua did. He baptized people right and left, and his, uh, mostly actually his disciples. But uh, so it was done once a year at Easter, and uh, that was where the vigil survived, as you did that before you were, you were you'd given a new name and baptized and so on. But originally it was a powerful spiritual practice taught by Yeshua to his inner circle. And it comprised various levels of Merkava meditation and ascent, depending upon the capabilities of the Talmud. And the highest level of Mishkad was an all-night, one-to-one initiation that the Master Yeshua communicated to an advanced Talmud. It was an all-night, night heaven ascent through the seven spheres to the Agduat, or eighth heaven, and the zodiacal constellations, where the ascended saints acted as watchers to telepathically guide advanced human souls capable of receiving their service. Um, and he called this initiation the Ratzim of the Malkuth, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now, evidence for these inner circle teachings exists in a lot of places. <laughs> he says, to those outside, all is given in parables, but to you I will speak plainly and clearly. He says, do not give holy things to dogs. Yeshua would like to use uh, hyperbole. So he stated things in extremes. And he didn't really think that people were dogs, but that's, he meant by that, don't give holy things to people that will appreciate them. Do not cast your pearls to swine, same thing, lest they turn and rend you. Uh, hearing they do not hear, seeing they do not see, as it is written, and so on. The Gnostics claim to preserve the inner circle teachings in all of their Gospels and Apocalypses, although they may not have, and probably didn't. But the most interesting is the secret Gospel of Mark. <coughs> in this, the Master Yeshua performs an all-night initiation of a young man <coughs> into the Ratzim of the Malkuth, the mysteries of the kingdom. The homosexual Gnostic prophet Carpocrates seduced a young deacon in Alexandria who had access to the secret gospel of Mark, which Mark had written for the inner circle Christians. And he stole it and he changed the text in crucial places to give the appearance that Yeshua was doing a homosexual initiation so that he could capitalize on that. And he used it in his sect. <coughs> In his epistle to a churchman trying to reconstruct the original from the Carpocratian copy, since the original had been stolen by the Carpocratians, Clement of Alexandria says, and this is a letter that was recovered, a couple of pages of it was recovered by Morton Smith a half a century ago, 
in a in a, uh, a Greek Orthodox monastery of St. Catherine's, I think, in their, in their way up in the hill in their, in their scriptorium. It was a palimpsest text. He says, as for Mark then, during Peter's stay in Rome, he wrote an account of the Lord's doings, not, however, declaring all of them, nor yet hinting at the secret ones, but selecting what he thought most useful for increasing the faith of those who were being instructed. And that was, uh, that was what we call the Gospel of Mark. That's the public Gospel of Mark. And when he says of the Lord, he is using the word Mar. He is not using the word the Lord, meaning in, in that strong sense. Uh, but when Peter died a martyr, upside down on the cross, Mark came over to Alexandria, bringing both his own notes and those of Peter, from which he transferred to his former book, the Gospel of Mark. He made a bunch of additions. He transferred the things suitable to whatever makes for progress towards knowledge. And I'm underlining this for you. Thus he composed a more spiritual gospel for the use of those who were being perfected, which is a mystery school term. Nevertheless, he did not yet divulge the things not to be uttered. There's more stuff, but that's not in the sacred gospel. <coughs> Nor did he write down the hierophantic teaching of the Lord, which is very secret inner stuff. But to the stories already written, he added yet others and moreover brought in certain sayings of which he knew the interpretation would, as a mystagogue, lead the hearers into the innermost sanctuary of that truth hidden by seven veils. <laughs> Thus in some he prepared matters, neither grudgingly nor incautiously, in my opinion, and dying, he left his composition to the church in Alexandria, where it even yet is most carefully guarded, being read only to, in, to those who are being initiated into the great mysteries. To them, the Carpocratians, <coughs> the secret gospel is by Mark, but uh, one, uh, to them... <laughs> To them are Carpocratians, therefore, as I said above, one must never give way, nor when they put forward their falsification should one concede that the secret gospel is by Mark, but should even deny it on oath. So you have to understand that there are things that were kept so secret that, just like in the Eleusinian Mysteries, secrets that were not ever divulged for 2,500 years in the Eleusinian Mysteries. We just have to look at archaeological things. Uh, and these, and, and you should lie. If you have to. That's what he's telling you. Uh, this is uh, situation ethics, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, for, and then he quotes a saying, not all true things are to be said to all men. For this reason, the wisdom of God, ah, we're talking about Chachma again, through Solomon advises, quote, answer the fool from his folly teaching that the light of the truth should not be hidden from those who, that should be hidden from those who are mentally blind. Again it says, from him who is not shall be taken away and let the fool walk in darkness. But we are, quote, children of light, having been illuminated by the day spring of the Spirit of the Lord from on high. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, it says, there is liberty, for all things are pure to the pure. So. As you can see, there is, uh, this is a very interesting document that was found. It's still been, the, the authenticity has still been disputed, but people who have studied, studied it are about evenly divided on its authenticity. I think it's authentic. Yeah, too many things in it ring true. Yeah. Now, am I understanding that somebody found the secret gospel of Mark, but what they found was the Carpocrates alteration of it? Well, no, what happened is in Alexandria there was this secret gospel of Mark. One copy of it was stolen or it was gotten by seducing a deacon in the church and it disappeared. Now, in another place, people wanted to have a copy of this gospel and they were trying to reconstruct it with, with the Carpocration version which they had. And what <coughs> Clement did is he said, I, I have this. Yeah, I will tell you. And then what he does in his letter, he says, okay, at this person, at this place, insert that and delete that, because this is what it really says. And there are many other things in it, and we'll look at some parts of it. So, yeah. I, I remember watching a, I think it was a program on the History Channel, where it was dealing with 
there's lots of stuff now coming out about uh, Jesus, which is not quite to the level that we study, but it's beyond regular, you know, Christianity. And this is one of the topics that came up about an all uh, Jesus doing an all night vigil, uh, <clears throat> rather vigil, with a young man. And it's taken to be a homosexual action. And yeah. I think this is what they're talking about. Because, you know, when they're talking about all night vigil, of course, I'm, you know, we're aware of that. And that such things happen. But when they layer in this concept that it might have been a homosexual experience, then it's like, wait a minute, this is totally off base. But of course, you know, there are those kind of people who would think that, and there are those kind of people who would alter a document, you know, to push for that yeah, kind of agenda. Yeah, yeah, especially the leader of the corporations. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, he was gay. Anyway, um, the midnight ascent of Yeshua would be the highest divine communion to be messianic bliss. This is where this would be involved. You didn't do it in order to achieve bliss, you did it to achieve communion with God. Uh, these would be the initiatic mysteries of the Malkuth, and it would involve a divine vision. And the mystery religions always at the end of the, uh, the Eleusinian mysteries or whatever, there was a visio beatifica, that's the technical term for the, for the the vision that is had after one makes contact with the deities, etc. And that would be what the Kabbalists later would call the vast face of God, which is macroposopus. Uh, Yeshua said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's a pretty heavy statement. Uh, there are probable degrees of ascent, from lowest to highest degrees, in my opinion. Yeshua alone on the wilderness and the mountaintop in seclusion. Yeshua initiates one Talmud into the Ratzim of the Malkuth, that would be like on the Mount of Olives. Uh, Yeshua meditates with a small number of close Talmudim in a local high place somewhere, like the so-called Transfiguration. And the probable time and place is during the night heaven, at nighttime. The new moon for a dark sky for the highest ascent, because you that's the place that you do it and a full moon for communion with ascended saints and guides, and midnight for the greatest calming of human and animal vibrations, and there are other reasons for midnight as well, um, a secluded mountain or hilltop or upper room, the parameters for our Mishkad that we're going to do are we're going to go into the early night heaven <laughs> on a full moon. We're going to meet here at about actually 9.30, not 9 p.m., but 9.30. Uh, the full moon is an excellent time for uh, uh, full moon meditations are known in many different traditions as very important times to make a communion with the divine. Uh, that divine is the, what we call the communio sanctorum. This is the community of saints. This, these are those who guide us and protect us. And full moon meditations are done for that purpose and Alice Bailey traditions and other kinds of things, theosophical traditions. So you need to dress very warmly and you can pick up, we'll meet here and then we'll pick up meditation cushions, whatever we need, and we'll drive up to this place. This is the uh, memorial shrine where there's a parking place and we'll walk from there to where we're going to go. We're going to walk to the Kuan Yin or Chen Rezig or Av Avalokiteshvara shrine and meadow. Uh, where there's, uh, I don't have a picture of it, but there's a wonderful white image of, of the mother of the world. She's, uh, Kuan Yin is, is the same divine figure in many cultures. She's the Asian version of the virgin mother of the world, the Kori Cosmo. No consort. She's, she's perfectly designed. She's Persephone, she's Ishtar, she's Inanna, she's all these things. Uh, and uh, that's why we're going to go there. 
And so we'll have a one hour sort of guided Merkava meditation that will be guided for a while and it'll be silent. Yeah. Well, and Persephone and Ishtar, they have consorts. They're not consorts though. They're husbands. Really. They're husbands, yeah. But, they're, but they are fully divine. They have no need of a consort. And they were accessed on their own shrines individually, not through, not as a consort of the God. They were What's the difference between consort and husband? Well, uh, a, a male deity will have uh, female consorts, and a female deity will have male consorts, but a tr an androgynous deity is very often expressed in terms of two beings that way, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, when you have a, if you hear, you see pictures of Tibetan deities in the Yab Yum uh, posture, which is in, in union, divine union. And the main deity is the one, the, the, the male who's holding the female. The female, you just see the side of the face or something like that. But that's really what an angel is, it's an androgynous being. Now, these, vir the virgin mothers, the virgin mother type deities like Ishtar and Iman and so on, were associated with the highest god of the universe, not with just another deity, another god. They were not like angels, or, or, or they were not like eons of the play Roma. They were, they were the feminine aspect of Godhead. So it's really one unity. So however you address Godhead through the feminine part or through the masculine part, you're addressing God and they have their own separate altars. So when we go to, we, when we sit in front of Kuan Yin, an ancient person would be addressing the Father, Mother, God. And that's what I mean by these kinds of things. Uh, so tonight we'll do our, we'll do our Shabbat. This is going to be a Shabbat Equinoctial Full Moon Mishkan. <laughs> and uh, you meet here at 9.30 and we'll take you up to this place. And then tomorrow morning, the other thing you have tomorrow morning, we're going to do the Halakha walk. And we're going to assemble here at the Pine Room, but not immediately after breakfast, because I've decided I wanted to do the, uh, the Medicine Buddha Puja at 8 o'clock. <laughs> and we have plenty of time. so. Any of those of you who would like to join me, I think, Will, are you going to do it too? Uh, we'll go to the Gampa, which is the main meditation room at 8 o'clock, and the puja lasts for about 45 minutes, and then we can meet here at 9 o'clock for the Hanukkah walk. And we'll, again, take cars up here. The walk will, it's about three quarters of a mile. It will take us probably an hour to do max, and then we'll come back down here and snack and then we'll start another session. We're taking cars on the walk? No, we're taking cars up to where we have to go in order to get on the walk. Okay. It's a very high place, it's a very steep walk. People who have back problems, people who have knee problems that are recovering from, things like that, do not want to have to make this walk. I made it to find out what it would be like. I spent a couple hours making the walk and finding out what it would be. And it's a, a little bit of a challenge for a normal, healthy person. Uh, it would be, it'd be a, not a good idea for someone who's got problems with knees, as, as Ellie has and other people. So I, I, walking up is not the point of it. Not, it's not to get us exhausted. The point is to walk over to the path from what, that place and then take the walk there. So I don't want to do a big uh, challenge in the chariots of fire kind of walk. You know, so uh, what? Do you have to do anything to prepare for the puja? No. You just show up and here I am? Whatever you do in the morning before you go out into the world would be what you would do. <laughs> and, and you know where the gompa is? The home? Yes. We and it's very appropriate because when we go on the Halakawa, we're going to be doing comparative Christianity and Buddhism. <laughs> because Buddhism is basically Christian Halakha with a couple of changes like dietary rules and things like that. It's basically authentic Yeshua Halakha. 
And not, I'm not talking about Theravada Buddhism. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this kind of Buddhism we have here today, which is Vajrayana, that is very, very, very similar to Yeshua's practice. It, it is. It's Tibetan Buddhism. It's Vajrayana. It came out of the Mahayana, which developed right after the time of Christianity, and Pure Land Buddhism, etc. And then through the guy on that picture over there, Padmasambhava, who brought it to Tibet, uh, Tibetan Buddhism developed, and it has the longest single living lineage uh, that we have in Buddhism where you can trace teacher to student, teacher to student, that's maybe about six or seven hundred years. Of course, Christianity has the longest lineage that exists, 2,000 years. Well, there's, you know, when you, even though these religions to a great extent are very different, but on a spiritual level, it's just a matter of language and tradition that separates them. There's really, there's really no difference at the spiritual level. But the spiritual level is very abstract because uh, you're talking about the human soul and the human spirit and what we are after our personalities are totally gone, and our cultures are gone, and everything else, and the body dies and decays, and then you leave your soul, you leave your nephish behind, and everything. So. It's great and well to say they're all the same at this higher level, but it's very hard to get there with your mind to see how they're all the same, because there still are a lot of distinctions, and some of them are pretty great. Uh, like the distinction between a religion that absolutely says there's no such thing as reincarnation, and one says it's absolutely committed. Yes, there is reincarnation. It's all based on that. How we reconcile uh, Sufism and Buddhism about reincarnation. There's no reconciling the two. Well, see, but that's, 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 get, that's getting hung up on the wrong things. Maybe so. <laughs> because, uh, see, that's one of the problems with humans. Because humans invent religion. It's their, it's their way of understanding spirituality. But like anything humans do, they have a way of getting it all complex and misunderstanding. It's all screwed up, and it leads to nothing but conflict. If you could just get rid of the humans, <laughs> it would work smoothly. I think the word for you is misanthrope. Is that what it is? I don't know. No, it's not. Curmudgeon. Curmudgeon. Yeah. But we do have to, you're right, there's, there is so much we have to shed in order to get somewhere. And to us, it feels like giving up everything, but it's not. Anyway, I'm going to close this.